Welcome to Marketing Made Simple TV. I'm Jeff Ogden, the host of the show, and we're thrilled to have you back again today. We've got a wonderful guest for you today, the, the wonderful Guy Kawasaki. Let me tell you a little bit about Guy. He's the co-founder of Altop, an online magazine rack, a popular topics on the web. He's also a founder of Garage Technology Vendors. Previously, he was the chief evangelist of, of Apple, which is also pretty cool. He's, he's quite a prolific author, too. He's authored 10 books, Enchantment, Reality Check, The Art of the Start, Rules for Revolutionaries, How to Drive Your Competition Crazy, Selling the Dream, The Macintosh Way, etc. <laughs> he's got a BA from Stanford University and an MBA from UCLA, as well as an honorary doctorate from Babson College. So let's welcome the wonderful Guy Kawasaki to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And... Uh... You know, I, I just need to point out that it's uh, Garage Technology uh, Ventures. Garage, <laughs> so, oh, I misread it. I'm sorry, Guy. Yeah, that's it's okay. Garage that's Technology okay. Ventures. Okay. I, I thought maybe you're testing to see if I was paying attention to my intro, and I am. So there you go. <laughs> well, good. I passed the IQ test. You did pass it. You passed it with flying colors. I'm going to start yeah. you off with a question I ask every guest on the show, and it's a very simple okay. question. Who are you, and what do you do? Okay, so uh, my name is Guy Kawasaki, and I'm an author, a speaker, and uh, much of my time is now spent as an advisor to Motorola, uh, the uh, part of uh, Google that manufactures uh, cellular phones. And I have written 12 books in the last, oh God, <laughs> few decades. Uh, my latest book is called Ape, Author, Publisher, Entrepreneur. Many people know me because of my work at Apple, where I was uh, the first time Apple software evangelist, and the second time I was Apple's chief evangelist. You've got some pretty amazing experience there. So uh, tell us, now you, your new book is called yes. Ape, Author, Publisher, and Entrepreneur. We've had a, we have a lot of authors on this show. We had Dan, Daniel Pink, who you probably uh -huh. know, A Whole New Mind and all this. He's best-selling author. And a lot of people with books come on the show because obviously like TV talk shows, book, people with stuff to promote go on shows. Yes. So, what, what a concept. Yes. Work. So let's talk to me about your book, and you've done a lot of books, and how has book publishing changed? What changes have you seen happen in the industry? Okay, so Ape is really a book that will help you go through the process of publishing a book by yourself. And there are fundamentally three steps. You author it, which is writing it. You publish it, which means you lay it out and you actually produce it. And then you entrepreneur it, which means that you have to sell it. Uh, and of the three stages, I'll tell you, most people find the third stage, entrepreneuring, the hardest because it's so far away from writing. The gist of the book is that you can control this process. You don't need to beg uh, or suck up to six large companies in New York to publish your book. You can control the process. You can also make more money doing it. And I think you get greater satisfaction. Uh, so I, I have been published 10 times, and I self-published two times. And so that's basically where I'm coming from. I'd like to empower a generation of authors and writers to do their own thing. That's, that's good advice, and I think, you know, in this changing world, I think more people can do things themselves, and uh, it's easier for small entrepreneurs to compete against giant companies. Yes. Um, I, I know you're big in social media. I see you all the time on Twitter, and I, I read your book, Enchantment, which I absolutely love that book. It's a wonderful book, and I recommend everyone read it. But, uh, but in that book, you said your favorite uh, social network was Twitter, and I saw you on a... Mm -hmm. A Google Plus, uh, Google webcast, and you said Google Plus is now your favorite. Why yeah. did you fall out of love with Twitter? You know, it's not so much I fell out of love with, with Twitter as much as I fell in love more with Google Plus. So I love Twitter for the immediacy, for the ease. You know, it's only 140 characters. You don't need to think a lot. Uh, and so that was spectacular for a while. You know, you could reach millions of people. But now uh, I switched over to Google Plus because I can have longer messages. I can have uh, pictures in line, video in line. There's much better threading of a conversation. You know, in, in Twitter, if you tweet a specific topic, if you want people to engage with that topic and you to engage with them after they've engaged, the best case is you 
type an at sign and you search for your name to see when they responded to you. And that just becomes problematic when you have 1.2 million followers. Uh, it's not so easy to thread a message on Twitter. So uh, I think Google Plus just took it uh, a, a much higher level. I think you're selling yourself a little short because I looked you up and you're a little bit above 1.2 million guy. <laughs> uh, you know, I think your date is a little old. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a be modest Friday. <laughs> yes, there you go. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about marketing. Since you know marketing and you know entrepreneurship, talk, talk to us about how marketing has changed and what you see as the keys to being successful in marketing today. In the old world, i.e., 10 years ago, I would say marketing was top down. You found the famous journalist, the famous analyst, the expert, you know, you sucked up to him or her, you hoped that he or she would bless your product and tell the great unwashed masses what to do. And I think that has completely changed now, primarily because of social media, that now you have to plant many seeds. You don't know who's going to help your product or service tip. It could be Lonely Boy 15 instead of the Wall Street Journal. And Lonely Boy 15 uh, is hard to find. Lonely Boy 15 still lives with his mother. Lonely Boy 15 sleeps on Buzz Lightyear sheets. Uh, you know, Lonely 15 is not at a Wall Street Journal account. And so with that in mind, uh, you have to use all the social media. You have to just go at it. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's much more of a broadcast thing. Uh, it's, it's not so much I'm going to rifle shoot that one New York Times uh, reporter, that one Wall Street Journal reporter. I actually think it's much better because when it's a rifle shot and you're you're sucking up to these powerful, famous people, uh, then there's gatekeepers and the sheer volume of what they're dealing with it gets prohibitive. But in a in a more flattened world, a more uh, democratized world where anybody could help you, I think that just leads to more interaction, more engagement, and better marketing. That's a great point, and I think this TV show is a perfect mm -hmm. example of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I booked mm -hmm. Beth Comstock, the chief marketing officer of GE, normally you'd call GE, ask to talk to Beth, you talk to 10 assistants, you never get through, right? right? You, you got to, like, explain to her what you're trying to do. I booked her through Twitter. Really? I, I just asked her to be on the show, and she said, sure, and direct messages, and boom, she's on the show. There you go. So, you know, th that the world has... That would, Absolutely. that would have never happened in the old days. And even with You're email, absolute. even with email it wouldn't have happened because she probably gets 500 messages a day and she probably has an assistant screening those messages. Uh, so, you know, Twitter is a beautiful thing for that. It really is that you can make connections with all kinds of people. I mean, how would you and I have met if it weren't for social media? We never would have. That's true. So. That's true. <laughs> It's really true. So let's talk about, take an adjunct from that. We live in a democratic, uh, a more democratized world where things are bottom up. Yeah. Talk to us about personal branding. Well, Why does somebody need to be out there and build up a personal brand? What if you have a good job? You've got a really good job. You're working for a company. You're making a good income. Why do you have to build a personal brand? Well, maybe you don't. <laughs> uh, the way you described it, uh, if you are very confident in your abilities and you're very confident in your company never you know, laying you off or, or getting sold, uh, maybe you don't. But if you're the other 99% of the world, I think it's always good to have a personal brand that you know, the company is not making you. That you, know, you might not be making the company, but if the company ever goes away, you still have a personal brand to depend on. If for nothing else, then your job search. So I, I, I can't imagine a scenario where it's bad to have a personal brand unless you're like an undercover you know, drug uh, agent. But other than that, I, I, I really think it's useful. And uh, you, know, it, you just never know. And it's, it's kind of too late to build a personal brand if you've lost the podium of the company that you worked for. You're absolutely right. And Paul Denay, who's the global head of marketing for a company called Maximize, who's a very good mm -hmm. friend of mine, and he's been writing a blog forever. And he gets a good, he used to work for uh, Price Waterhouse, be their CMO. And he mm -hmm. continues to blog and he's out there and doing events and everything. And he does a great job of a personal brand. And everybody knows Paul. So yeah. I think that's a good example of 
people have to do. And you're right that 99% of people, you never know when your company is <laughs> going to be bought, sold. Your boss is going to leave yep. the company and new management is going to come in. You just don't well, know. Even so. if none of those things occur, I would make the case that you would be a better marketer if you were on the firing line anyway. Because being on the firing line, you know, then when, when some agency comes in and tries to tell you, you know, how Twitter works and how Pinterest works and how Facebook works and, you know, why you should pay them $500 an hour and then they're going to let a, an intern that they just hired away for the summer from a liberal arts college, you know, you can, you, you can call BS on them and say, listen, you know, you can't tell me that it takes 10 people uh, uh, working full time to monitor Pinterest for us, you know. And and so because you you are on Pinterest or LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus, I think it will lead to better marketing decisions overall. That's interesting, and I, I agree with you. And I think for those of us who have been out there a while and have a few gray hairs under this hat, um, you have to continually re reinvent yourself and yes. embrace these technologies. So, yeah. But but now I know you're working with Motorola. And yes. uh, and that's got to be pretty exciting to be what you're doing. So tell us about that, not just about what you're doing, but how did it come about? How did they find you? What? How did it all start? I mean, this ties I, into the personal branding thing too, Guy. Well, yeah, it, it all started with a friend who worked at Apple when I was at, at Apple. And he left Apple, as I did. And one day he called me up and he said, you know, um, Google is offering me a job. Do you think I should take it? And this is when Google was, you know, just starting. And I said, yeah, absolutely, you should take it. And so he took my advice and started there. And God, I don't even want to know how much he's worth. It, it literally could be in the billions. Um, I should have taken the job and told him not to take the job. But anyway, that's a different path. So uh, I was friends with him, remained friends with him. And one day he introduced me to someone who uh, was at Google named Dennis Woodside, but Dennis Woodside is the person who's now the CEO of Motorola after Google bought Motorola. And we got to talking, and they, they gave me a Motorola Droid Razor Max to use. Uh, that was my first uh, Android phone, and it had a 4G LTE, and it, you know, it had this great battery, and I fell in love with Androids. So we just kept in touch, and then I fell in love with Android. I love Google. I love mobile devices, and uh, you know, Motorola is sort of at the the Venn diagram of those three circles is Motorola, and so they they need to have a you know, sort of big change in Motorola. Uh, the way I look at it, Motorola in 2013 is like Apple in 1997. Uh, 1997 is when Steve made his second uh, stint there. And in 1998, he introduced the colored IMAX, the ones that were in those tangerine, cherry, and you know, bondi blue colors. And I think that was the turning point for Apple. So I think uh, Motorola is at the cusp of this great turning point, and I want to help them make that turning point. So talk to us about the world of business and how you know yes. things change. And I, I use the example of Kodak. I saw the, the chart, uh, Jeffrey uh -huh. Hazlett, who was on the show, shows a chart of the sale of film. And it goes up and up and up and then just falls off a cliff. <laughs> yes. So yes. Talk, to us, talk to me a little bit about the, the transition of companies that go through and when their market changes and dealing with that oh. and, and your experience with Motorola and what you saw at Apple. So the, the way I interpret those kind of things is that there are waves of innovation. And so there was, you know, well, at one point, you know, uh, image capture was a painting, right? And, and uh, you know, not that many people could paint, not that many people could afford to paint. And then the next curve was, you know, early photography. And photography was so much better than painting. And then there was color photography. And then, you know, there's also another curve called instant photography. So you, you kept getting cheaper and cheaper, faster and faster, more and more people could use it. And then next thing you know, there's, you know, camera, digital photography. And that was a huge revolution. That's what, that's what tanked Kodak. And now you could make the case that, you know, I, whenever I get asked to take a picture a lot, like at things like South by Southwest. And um, what I did at this South by Southwest is I took a picture of everybody taking a picture of me. 
And if you look at those 65 or 70 pictures, roughly 90% are cameras on phones, not SLR cameras, you know, not standalone cameras. So 90% of the pictures taken of me are smartphones. And so that's sort of the next curve. And so my interpretation is, you know, there's always another curve. You can duke it out on the curve. You can have a better painter. You can then have a better black and white camera. You can have a better uh, full, full frame camera. You can have a better, you know, the next thing you know, you're on the smartphone with a camera curve. So you can always be on the same curve, duking it out, making it 10 or 15% better. But true innovation happens when you get from one curve to the next curve. And that's where it gets interesting. That's fascinating, and, and you're absolutely right. Just completely reinvent yourself. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. Well, we all also, carry cameras. Yeah. Well, I was just going to Go say it's easy. It's easy for us two talking heads to say this, right? It's quite the other thing to actually build that curve or invent that curve. That's a little harder. You're right. It is. It is. Yep. You're absolutely right. So anyway, um, yeah, it's been a, a fascinating chat. Um, let's. I want to give you an, a chance to talk directly to our audience okay. and just kind of say whatever's on your mind. If you could just say a few words and and okay. tell the the great Gawas, guy Kawasaki talking to you. So let's well, do that. I don't know if it's the great guy Kawasaki talking to you, but I just want to you know reiterate that I think the world is getting much flatter, much more democratic. Uh, and it's not going to reverse itself. You know, that, that horse is out of the barn. And so the way to do this is to assume that it's going to get more democratized and how can you, you know, get on that curve and even get on the next curve. And it's going to be because the world is flatter and freer and more open source and cheaper. And I think that's just good for everybody. Thanks, Guy. Right. Final question. Yeah. Where... Now, the audience will want to learn about you. Where can they learn about you, your books, all the stuff you're doing? Okay. Where's the best place okay. to go? So the best place to learn about my book is definitely apethebook.com. Uh, that is my most recent work. The best place to see what I'm doing at any given moment is uh, Google+, Plus, where I'm Guy Kawasaki. Uh, that is me manually, by myself. Uh, you know, that is true, unfiltered Guy Kawasaki. And so those are the best two places. I want to thank Guy Kawasaki for being a wonderful guest on the show. Really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope all of you enjoyed it as much as I did too. Before we go, we got to thank our sponsors because they pay the bills. Avitage, a great content marketing company up in the Boston area, video content. Digital Ethos, a nonprofit educational organization, digitalethos.org. Communication Strategy Group, PR, brand telling, uh, executive coaching, communicationstrategygroup.com, and the world's largest revenue marketing company, Eloqua. Um, they also sponsor the show. And lastly, the, the company that provides this wonderful platform is Watchitu. So go to watchitu.com. Marketing Made Simple TV uh, premieres every Thursday at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific. So until next week, we'll see you next time on Marketing Made Simple TV.